So intimacy and sexuality is something that is for each and each of us something very unique and very intimate. Yet it's something that is important in all of our lives. And it's something that we don't discuss very often, openly, especially not at tech events. But here at Pioneers, we're trying to discuss topics that are not discussed very often. So today's session will focus on the intersection between intimacy and sexuality and technology. And for this, we have three great experts that will discuss this together on a panel here on stage. Um, it's Stephanie Ellis from Mystery Wipe, then Kate Derlin from the Goldsmith University of London, and Nikki Hodgson, who is a journalist, an author, and a dating consultant, and she will be the one moderating this session. I'm going to start by asking us what we understand by the term intimacy in relation to sex tech. So, Steph, any ideas? Um, intimacy in relation to tech. I guess intimacy is thought of as a feeling of closeness or connection. Um, and traditionally, that would be between two people in a, some kind of sexual scenario. But as things have become much more digital, I think you no longer need to think of two people in the same place to consider someone being intimate with another person. And that's where I think digital and technology is starting to change the way that we are intimate with each other. I think intimacy really covers um, a closeness, an emotional closeness or a physical closeness. Um, and it can involve sex. It doesn't necessarily have to. Um, and sex isn't just a straightforward, what everyone expects in a very monoheteronormative way. So it could be sex, it could be on your own, it could be with multiple people, it could be penis and vagina, it could be anything goes really. It's that, it's that response you get, that kind of feel good factor, the hormones that are released and, and just make you feel really good. All right, great. So that's what we're going to be working from today, just so you know. Um, OK, so I think when we talk about intimacy in sex tech, we presume that we have an intimacy deficit now and that technology is actually making us less intimate than we've ever been before. Do we think this is true? Um, I don't think, personally, that more technology equals less intimacy. It's about how we use that technology. Technology is neutral. It's all about the context you place it in and how you use it. Kate, do you have anything to add to that? Um, like Stephanie was saying, we, we always get these scare stories. There's a, there's a whole dystopian thread that runs through science fiction where the, you know, the robots are coming, they're going to take our jobs, steal our partners, um, kill us all. And I think we, we tend to kind of veer towards that dystopian side of things rather than thinking about the benefits. So we've got technology. People say, oh, the smartphone is the death of, of social interaction. But actually, with a smartphone, I can be in contact with my loved ones on the other side of the globe having real-time video conversations. So I think the opportunities to enhance our relationships are there in the technology. And actually, that's one of the most common things that especially men say to me when they learn what I do. They're like, oh, so you're trying to replace me, are you? And I'm like, no, no. <laughs> technology isn't a replacement. It's an it's enhancement. enhancement. Do we actually kind of have a, um, a dopaminic response to robots when they interact with us? Um, well, there needs to be a lot more work done in this. We know that people can bond a lot with companion robots. We've seen it with existing companion robots that are in use today, um, even if they're zoomorphic ones like Paro, the, the little seal cub. Um, people get attached. There's, been, there's a study in a nursing home where the residents knew that they were interacting with the robots. Uh, it was made very, very clear to them. And yet, at the end of the trial period, they were showing it photographs of their grandkids. So there's a lot of... Um, a lot of bonding that goes on. Yeah, so what do we think that technology can do for monogamy? <laughs> or how can, it, how can it give us a, I don't know, what, 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 what's the new scale of monogamy now? Well, for example, with the rise of teledildonics, it means you can connect to your partner who is hundreds of miles away, if, um, if they're maybe on a business trip, for example. That's one good example. Um, in my perspective, it's, technology is about helping people discover things about their bodies, about what they like, what they don't like. And I think there are many apps and bits of hardware that will help bring people together. Sex toys are, becoming, are much more accepted these days and have moved from being um, quite ridiculous looking copies of genitals, just very beautiful, 
pieces of technology. <laughs> there's still a lot of um, there's still a lot of taboo around the development of it. Um, I'm one of the few academics working um, on sex technology because academia doesn't really take it seriously. Um, and Stephanie has you know gone through a, a process of trying to bring her product to market. Um, faced with people who don't really see the need for it or are worried about investing in, a, in a, an adult area. Mm -hmm. So I think we, there's, there's a long way to go because this is a, a big commercial business. I've wondered if part of the problem has been that it's been men designing these objects for themselves, for partners, but not with very much consultation of women. Yep. What do we think? Um, <laughs> it's certainly in the case of um, sex robots, because we are seeing this happening now, and that we don't really have robots per se, the sex robots that you may know about the real doll type of thing, where it's just a poseable silicone woman with a little bit of interactivity, and they're introducing AI into that to get response, but it's, it's very basic. Um, and these are products that are designed for a very niche demographic, um, but there's no reason why that should be the case. I, mean, I think people are very much of the opinion that if you're building some kind of sex robot, it should look human, it tends to look female. Break out of that. That's, that doesn't have to be the way. Yeah. And what do you think, Steph? Because we know like, the vibrator was invented by men, and then what you're designing is, you know, it's kind of its ancestor is the vibrator. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think for a very long time, we've uh, created products based on assumptions. And that's why you've seen, for example, products that have been developed to be like genitalia for so long. Uh, we make assumptions about what people like, what they don't like, what's acceptable in society, and then products have been developed along those lines. Whereas now, there is more funding available for research, there's more research being done. So products that look completely unlike, you could leave on your bedside table or in, in your kitchen and no one would know what they were. Um, those kinds of products are now being developed. Do we think that women have being burdened with being the custodians of intimacy in relationships? And do we see that translating into the tech that they work on or the tech they're forced to develop? I think that does happen. I think there's a, there's a lot of social conditioning going on as to what's expected. Um, and you know the, the, the data that's put into this, um, the way that things are being built, they're being built from a perspective that's not necessarily got a, a, an influence or a female influence. So I think there is a bit of that. There's an expectation for, for women to be, you know, it's, it's sort of this investment in emotional side of things that is probably overestimated in a lot of ways. And yes, they're expected to perpetuate that. How would funding help you? How would it help your project? Um, like any startup, we need funding to scale. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, the thing is, is that uh, well, VCs don't touch sex. VCs don't do sex. Mm. So more angel investors uh, and a more diverse group of those is always a great thing, I think. What about you? Would it be nice to have some money from industry to fund your research? Um, yeah, definitely. And not just in the realm of sex tech. I think there needs to be a lot more um, to and fro between industry and academia because it tends to happen in a, in a sort of spin-out way. So we'll find some academics, they'll start a spin-out, um, they'll get involved. But I think we need to be looking at it on a better level than that. We need to be actually coming in there and funding studentships, funding PhDs. And it doesn't have to be large scale. At the moment, it tends to be large scale organizations. But I think that's, that's an area where there can be small investments in a small pool um, that would really help. And it's, it really is doubly beneficial because you get the expertise. And in return, um, we get to see our work actually being applied somewhere, which is always really nice. So if somebody was listening today and they were thinking, OK, I, I am interested in bringing some kind of gadget into my um, home life or some kind of bot or I don't know, I want to know more, what kind of conversation would they need to have with a partner <laughs> to, 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 to bring that in? <laughs> well, have a conversation. That's yeah. the first thing, right? Okay. I think um, because we live in a world where sex is still such a taboo, um, there's so much to be said for just having that conversation to begin with. Yes, it might feel awkward to begin with, but I find that, and I've traveled a lot and spoken to a lot of different people in a lot of different countries, and I find that once you start the conversation, it gets a lot easier. The hardest bit is sparking that conversation. Once you've started it and you're on your way, it gets easier. So what do we think is the greatest benefit to our intimacy from technology? Has it been invented yet? Or currently, you know, with the, with the things that we have available to us now, what's the, the, the biggest enhancement we can we can experience. I think it's um, just in a broader sense. I think it's the fact that there, you know, some people may not want to have sex, but there are people out there who do want to have sex and are not able to do so for a number of reasons, whether it's physiological or psychological. And if we can develop things that help people have a fulfilled life, a fulfilled sex life, fulfilled, and, and you know, intimacy, then 
you know, that's a really lovely thing to do. I'm really interested in the idea of virtual reality sex. And for me, one of the really fascinating things will happen is when you can have a full romantic and sexual relationship with someone you've never met in real life. Uh, so you could go on a date with them, you could go to the cinema, you could go to the park, and you could have sex with them, even though you'd never met face to face. And for me, that then starts to, um, you have much bigger questions, like if you've never met someone and you're having sex with them, does it actually matter what they look like? in real life. Mm. And the other way around, does it matter what you look like? You could create an avatar in the virtual world, which is something completely different. You, it could be a different height, or a different body shape, or even a different gender. Um, and I think once you experience things from other people's point of view, it could really be quite interesting in terms of how we develop empathy for other people's experiences.